So I know that the uh, majority, in fact, the unanimous majority, if I'm not mistaken, of other presenters this morning have chosen to sit. Uh, where I come from, we have a very different norm that I'm used to, so I'm used to standing up, and it's sort of my hope today that if I stand up confidently enough and consistently enough, then even if you won't admit it publicly in polite company, and even if you won't do it yourself, maybe, just maybe, uh, deep within your heart where private judgments are made, you might think, eh, I think it's okay. It's okay to stand, hopefully. Uh, and barring that, um, let me see if I can get rid of this. Barring that, if I'm not successful in convincing you that standing is a, an adequate style, maybe I can convince you that I'm actually, in fact, uh, the color green. But we'll see. Or maybe not. Let me blow this up here. Ah. No. All right, success. So um, I want to begin by uh, paying tribute just very briefly to uh, Moscovici. And I want to note um, just very quickly, as I am here representing Timothy Hayes and Wendy Wood, my uh, advisor and collaborator, Wendy, as a very direct um, link to this lineage, she conducted a, an extensive uh, meta-analysis of minority influence studies uh, in the early 1990s, so all of the work that had been done up till about, I believe, 1993, um, and found a, a variety of complex patterns of influence that, that may have resulted in part because minority identity has been operationalized in so many different kinds of ways. So uh, it could be uh, power and social structures, so something like 88% um, versus 12% that we just saw, or it could be holding a deviant opinion on an attitudinal uh, item, or it could be ha holding a deviant uh, group identity, so something like being a radical lesbian feminist in Texas in America in the 1990s, or maybe being a, a member of the Roma people, a, a gypsy today in, in Europe in some, in some places. Um, so there's a variety of complex effects of minority influence depending in part uh, upon the way in which minorities are, are identified and construed. And the, and the work we're going to present today is really sort of not so much looking at the operationalization in terms of social structure or power, but looking at group identities that are formed around beliefs or social representations of, of the ideological world. Um, and the story I want to tell today begins, as many great stories do, with, uh, with pizza. And I'm not talking about the ideological divide between New York Neapolitan and Chicago Deep Dish, which would be a whole other separate talk. Um, but I'm talking about a news story that briefly had its 15 minutes of fame about 18 months ago. I know a lot has happened since then in America. But about 18 months ago, uh, Memories Pizza in Washington, Indiana, uh, was made briefly famous when the owner of Memories Pizza, Crystal O'Connor, was interviewed by the local news about her feelings and reflections on Indiana's newly ratified Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And when she was asked by reporters how this would affect the way, the manner in which she ran her business, she had this to say. Uh, if a gay couple was to come into my pizza restaurant, my pizzeria, and if they wanted us to provide them pizza for their wedding, we'd have to say no. Memories Pizza is a Christian establishment. We're not discriminating against anyone that's just our belief, and anyone has the right to believe anything. Now, shortly after this local news broadcast hit, the internet uh, did what it did best and sort of exploded with chatter, and in particular, the Memories Pizza Yelp page, uh, started, which I think started out the day with seven reviews, very quickly had uh, just hundreds and hundreds, 285 reviews and one star, and the reviewers are making comments uh, like this. I recommend this place not for the religious-based discrimination, but for the poor woman's need to see a dentist. Ouch. Uh, the food tastes like hate. But you also have this other uh, John C. from Kansas City with a, an automatic uh, weapon as his avatar. It says, I appreciate it and respect a business that holds to good, decent, civilized American standards and practices. Kudos to you, Memories Pizza. Keep up the excellent work. So what we're starting to see emerge, or at least in my estimation here, uh, is these different ideological int interpretations or social representations of, of, of O'Connor's words. So you have one group of people who you might uh, think of as these religious people who identify with Chris, Crystal O'Connor who really construe this as an exercise of religious freedom. She's exercising her right to, to stand by her beliefs and serve who she wants, whereas there was another sort of less religious, perhaps more liberal group in America that construed this as an act of discrimination, very, very similar uh, to the discrimination that African Americans faced uh, it, it, leading up to you know, the, the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And so 
there were also some calls to behavioral actions, or we would say behavioral intentions. We had one person, uh, Jess Dooley, who said, who's going to Walkerton, Indiana to burn down Memories Pizza with me? Uh, we had another person who said, do you really want to financially support the, a company that treats some of your fellow citizens like second class citizens, boycott Memories Pizza? Um, and we had memes that went around about this. Um, no, my boycotting your business because I don't like your religious bigotry is not a violation of your freedom to practice your religion. But then here we have the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Your beliefs seem intolerant, so we're burning you at the stake. But perhaps the most, uh, and I, I just, you can't make this up, the most uh, incredible behavioral result, uh, and this is sort of payment or purchasing behavior, is that a bunch of these religious sympathizers, the people who really felt for Crystal O'Connor, started a GoFundMe campaign, taking donations for Memories Pizza, which briefly shut down and closed their doors in the wake of this controversy. Uh, and they raised no fewer than $842,442 to support this business. So I think it's safe to say, and this was just a story of the week at a point last year, uh, with these kind of ideological identity issues, um, I think, think these have significant behavioral uh, traction. All right, so what are the implications? So first we have somebody <coughs> saying a statement or an issue associated with a certain source, with a certain ideological identity. Uh, and the, this statement is then interpreted along ideological lines with attitudes and, and even uh, behavioral intentions and behaviors resulting. And to thinking about uh, ideological identity and group identity more broadly, um, I, I would be remiss not to mention Tajfel's uh, three component definition of group influence, which comprises a cognitive, evaluative, and components and also an emotional investment in one's group identity. And, and what we're arguing here is that this cognitive component really consists of these social representations and these ideological social meanings. And, and to give one uh, definition of ideological identity coming from John Jost, who famously wrote about this in 2006, ideology can be defined as a belief system of the individual that is typically shared with an identifiable group and that organizes, motivates, and gives meaning to behavior broadly construed. Um, and <laughs> I'll wait till you can see it. So we have, we, we've built upon this and, and also drawing upon uh, Moscovici's work on social representations and also Solomon Ash's early work on meaning change. Uh, we, can, we consider this ideological influence process to occur in two steps. I'll wait for it to oh, yeah. center. No, don't be sorry. I'm, I'm glad it's, it's visible. Um, and I don't know why you are seeing this, which I'm not on my machine. But in any case, I'll, I'll continue unless. It'll go away, don't worry. Okay, good. Um, oh, I see, that's because you shifted the thing. Okay, great. So at the first step, uh, recipient ideology and source group ideology uh, predict message interpretations, which would be in the middle. There they are. Uh, so something like this, if you hear a message or a statement, an ambiguous statement about marriage, and you know that the source is somebody like Crystal O'Connor, who's very religious, you might think, well, she means a very conservative, restrictive, religious definition of marriage, where marriage is only a man and a woman. It's only heterosexual in marriage. Whereas if the source is somebody like Barack Obama or Caitlyn Jenner or somebody who you know would have more liberal values, you might assume that they mean marriage to be more inclusive. So including all you know, LGBTQ individuals, people of all orientations inclusively. And similarly, you can get this from your own identity. So if you yourself are a religious person just reading a statement about marriage without a lot of reference, you might you know, use your own beliefs to interpret what the statement means and, and, and interpret marriage as more conservative and restrictive and, and vice versa if you were more liberal. And at the second step, these interpretations or, or, or social representations influence people's attitudes. But there's one last wrinkle, which is that this should, the nature in which interpretations should influence attitudes would depend on your own identity. So if I am a religious person and I believe that Crystal O'Connor means that marriage is only for, between a man and a woman, I might evaluate this more favorably. Um, but if I believe that Barack Obama is talking about marriage being very inclusive, I would evaluate it more negatively. So the, the, the manner in which uh, you, you, the interpretations affect your attitude should depend on your own identity and beliefs. So this is the model I'm hoping to show today. Um, and I want to quickly talk about three studies, or as many of them as I can get through before, before my five-minute warning. Uh, the first experiment, I just want to demonstrate this basic model, just this two-step process that harkens back to, to Ash and others. In experiment two, I want to manipulate our mediator and, and really test whether the manipulation of meaning uh, versus a manipulation of source group identity is most potent in affecting recipients' attitudes. And then in experiment three, if we have time, I want to uh, show a little field study 
um, testing the impact of meanings on real world behavior. Okay, experiment one, testing the basics two-step model. So this was an online service, uh, a survey that we did attempting to, to demonstrate this two-step process. Um, and the basic overview is we started by recruiting about 381 USC subject pool participants and we showed them an ambiguous statement that was either attributed to a democratic source or a Republican source. Uh, these were US students at the University of uh, Southern California. Then we measured how partisan, liberal versus conservative they identified themselves to be, or how, how, excuse me, how, how conservative or liberal they interpreted the statement to be before we measured their own self-identification as liberal versus conservative. Uh, and finally, we measured their attitudes. Um, and the predictions, again, were that, that influence would take this two-step model, which we've just reviewed, so I'm gonna, for time, go through that very quickly. Um, okay, so the statement that participants viewed was this one. To increase the quality of public education, the Department of Education needs to address the problem of children who are struggling academically. That's very nice and political and vague, ambiguous statement. Uh, and the source of this statement was this old white guy whose picture I found on the internet, who we told participants was Representative G.L. Seifert, who was either a, Republican, a Democrat from Massachusetts or a Republican from Texas. So people were randomly assigned to one of these two attributions. Then we asked participants what they felt the meaning of the statement was. Uh, we measured partisan meaning with two items that were, were highly reliable, greater than 0.8, so we uh, formed a composite from them. But the two items were how partisan overall do you feel the statement is? They're extremely liberal versus extremely conservative. And uh, how balanced between liberal and conservative ideas do you perceive the statement to be? Almost entirely liberal versus almost entirely conservative. All right, so results. At step one, we found that indeed, when the source was uh, shown to be a Democrat, participants ev evaluated the meaning to be more liberal, they, they interpreted the statement more liberally, and the reverse was true when the source was shown to be a Republican. And at step two, we found a very <laughs> bright and colorful uh, predicted interaction. And all this means here, all we're showing is that we have attitudes here on the y-axis. Um, Conservatives who interpreted the statement more liberally liked it less than when they interpreted it as conservative, and the reverse was true for liberals. And this is plotted at all scale points from you know, neutral or moderate all the way through extremely liberal and extremely conservative. And I, I do not wish to belabor this diagram, but we did get significant mediation. So there was an indirect influence of the source through people's interpretations. There were these conditional indirect effects where, where the manner in which this manifested depended on participants' own ideology. Uh, in the manner that we described. So, so one track would be, if the source is conservative, I interpret the message as more conservative. If I myself am a conservative, I like it more. And that indirect influence was significant. Okay, studying one summary. Uh, so we found here that the meaning of the message, the meaning of the statement depended on the ideological identity of the source. We found that the effect of meaning on agreement or disagreement with the message depended on recipient's ideology. And social influence exerted significant indirect influence through these interpretations or, or ideological social representations, you might say. So experiment two. Uh, we wanted to go a little bit deeper into this idea of, of our two-step model with meanings and representations uh, firmly situated in the center. We think this is a foundational concept. Um, but you might argue that there's two potential ways this could be construed. So our model, is something akin to this one where source influences interpretations or representations which then influence attitudes. But you might argue as, as Griffin and Bueller and a few other people might that it could be the opposite. It could be that source group identity simply cues a, an evaluative reaction, cues attitudes, and then people when asked by survey researchers like me just simply make up these interpretations uh, after the fact in a post hoc way. Um, and this has been addressed a little bit in some of the prior research with uh, varying the order of questionnaire items, but we wanted to go at this a different way. Um, and the main goal of experiment two was to manipulate very directly, experimentally, these uh, key levers of influence by either changing the source that participants associated with a certain meaning, holding that meaning constant, or changing the meaning associated with the source, holding the source constant. And I will explain in detail as best as I can uh, what this refers to. And then the, the dependent variable ultimately is attitude change from a first judgment to a second judgment. So let's go through it. All right, so in this study, we recruited uh, 600 
Amazon Mechanical Turk workers. And the source we showed them, these were sort of real working Americans, not undergrads. So we, we, instead of giving them a fake uh, congressman, we gave them real ones. So the source was either Senator Ed Markley, who is, who is a, a Democrat from Massachusetts, or Senator John Cornyn, who is a Republican from Texas. And we showed them one of two messages. So actually, this is, dovetails nicely with the previous talk. They're about environmental topics, environmentalism. So the first statement was, the US must remain a global leader in achieving the best environmental outcomes. And we gave participants two interpretations of what uh, the best environmental outcomes might mean. One was government regulation, which is sort of a more liberal idea of having government programs come in to, to take things over and regulate them. Or uh, individuals setting their own environmental priorities, which is a more conservative, free market uh, kind of social meaning. The second statement we showed participants was to ensure US energy safety, we need to develop our own energy resources. Well, what was the meaning of develop our own energy resources? We gave participants, again, two dichotomous options. One is solar and wind, investing in solar power, uh, which is a more liberal idea in America. And the other one is access to oil, which is a much more conservative, uh, we're hearing about that recently again, um, a much more conservative notion. And then we asked participants how much they agreed or disagreed with the statement on a seven point scale anchored by strongly disagree and, and strongly agree. And just at the basic step, we once again found our, our, our two step model of influence. So in a, a first initial judgment, Participants indeed interpreted the statement more conservatively when it was associated with a Republic from, for, Republican from Texas and more liberally when it was associated with a Democrat uh, from Massachusetts. And again, these interpretations affected their attitudes differently depending on their own ideological beliefs. Uh, but the key manipulation in this study occurred after this initial judgment, after this model. Um, and this is where it gets complicated and hopefully fun. Uh, so next we asked participants to make one of two alterations to their judgments. So alteration one was to imagine a different source intended the same meaning. So imagine you're taking a Qualtrics survey. You've seen that this statement about developing our own energy resources was said by this guy, who's a Democrat. Um, and you've indicated this judgment. We will show you this again. We'll show you this. Say that you, based on our prior questions, you've indicated that you think develop our own energy resources refers to solar and wind. Uh, but then we asked participants, now imagine that this statement, that it means exactly what you think, that this is exactly what the statement means. But imagine that this is actually said by the Republican from Texas. So that's judgment one that we're asking people to make. What would your attitudes be then? Now, alteration two is the reverse of that. Imagine that the same source intended a different meaning. So here again, we, we show participants this Democrat uh, from uh, Massachusetts and they interpret developing our own energy resources as meaning solar and wind. And we say, this is the interpretation that you've chosen, uh, and this is the source that we showed you. But now imagining uh, that, that this is exactly who said this, right? the same source, how would you evaluate the message? Another alteration. That's perfect, right, there you go. How would you evaluate the message? We'll, just, we'll, we'll stick with two on this one. How would, how would you evaluate the, the message if it actually, if he was actually referring to access to oil? So if this uh, sort of liberal Democrat was, was uh, espousing this sort of Trumpian you know, oil uh, belief, what would your attitudes be then? Okay, so results. For the first alteration, so imagine that a different source had the same meaning. You get this nice interaction plot, which looks lovely, except that none of the simple slopes are significant. So in a statistical sense, even though it kind of looks like this beautiful alligator mouth picture, nothing here is actually really going on. When people imagine that, that a Republican actually said the Democratic meaning, or that Democrat actually said uh, the Republican meaning. But when we ask participants to change the social representation, to change their interpretation of what they thought the statement meant, even holding the same source constant, then you get this highly significant interaction wherein uh, liberals who originally interpreted the message as liberal, but were asked to switch to thinking of it as conservative, so it's access to oil now instead of solar and wind, liked it much, much less than when the reverse was true. If they had to reinterpret a conservative meaning as liberal, they were much happier. And the exact opposite pattern was true uh, of conservatives. So, okay, experiment two, discussion, asking participants to imagine a statement that a, that a statement had a different social meaning exerted profound effects on their attitudes, whereas asking them to switch sources did not. That's the take home here. And I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over our fun behavioral demonstration and just get to the 
the sort of take home points at the end. So what did we learn? Uh, ideological influence appears to occur in a two-step process, wherein source and recipient ideology exert influences on people's interpretations or social representations of messages and statements. And recipient identity interacts with these inferred meanings to predict attitudes. Uh, and that perceived social meanings more than sources influence participants' attitudes. And you can take my word for it and read the eventual uh, paper, which we are currently revising. Uh, we also have some evidence that I didn't have time to discuss that social meanings also exerted influence on reported behavior. So more broadly, ideological influence is a central sort of internal process kind of in line with Moscovici's idea of conversion or changing the nature of what you think about reality. Uh, and it's centered around these interpretations or social representations. And it's my hope that this kind of research on uh, meanings of beliefs and social representations continues to be uh, a cornerstone of social influence research uh, in the future moving forward. And thank you very much for your time and attention.